Um, I guess this is just a bit more of a kind of tip for you guys. Um, I recommend, as with a film, getting a script of the film. You can find a PDF online and annotate that as much as you can. So for your first viewing, um, when you're actually watching the film, look for that plot, kind of the major characters, you know, just kind of um, understand what's going on. And then once you watch over it again, throughout your second viewing and your third viewing, you can look for some quotes and themes, minor characters, and then tap into those literary devices as well, or film techniques, they should be called, um, when addressing a film. Um, as for memorizing quotes, you can do that through getting a script as well if you find that you want to look up some certain moments um, but don't know exactly where they are in the film it might be helpful to just um, look for keywords throughout the actual script um, and you can group them by theme maybe in a quote, quote um, chart uh, or by character I think Sunset Boulevard can work for both um, and we'll go into some of this a bit later but you should kind of modify your quotes accordingly um, so that they fit into your paragraphs and that they flow smoothly rather than having 10 word 20 word chunks of um, evidence in there that's not what we like to see so for example um, you don't have to learn full chunks of the dialogue you can incorporate it like this sentence I've got as an example here so, the portrayal of Norma laying on her couch, surrounded by photographs of herself from her silent film era, illuminates her need to be constantly reminded about the, quote, heights of her career. So, that's an example as how we can incorporate that as well. And if you do like to have quote, um, kind of flashcards or something like that, you can also do the um, look-see, cover, write, check as well um, technique. Um, and just do that over and over again. Practice makes perfect in English. You can never really write too many essays. Um, that being said, it's good to write with purpose, you know, and um, consciously try and improve certain things. If you need to work on structure, then consciously try and improve that rather than just writing essays aimlessly. Um, amazing. So I guess we'll just get straight into the plot summary now. Um, so here's just a little three sentence summary for you guys, just to sum it up before we go into a scene by scene breakdown. So the film opened with down and out screenwriter Joe Gillis floating dead in a swimming pool before he, as the film's narrator, moves to recount the events leading to his demise. Finding himself at the decaying mansion of former silent film star Norma Desmond, Joe becomes increasingly entangled with her delusions and lavish lifestyle. Whilst he does eventually realise the destruction in the path he's on and longs for a simple life with Betty, Norma shoots and kills Joe amidst her fit of despair and madness, where the film's ending captures the tragic end to her fantasy, as well as the harsh realities of the film industry and the consequences of fame and obsession. So quite a lot to unpack in those three sentences there, but I think it's a good um, brief overview of the events in the film. And down here, we also just have some key ideas in the text, or some of them anyways. We'll be going through a couple of these um, when we take a look closer at the um, themes. Um, but just as a brief overview, we have the dangers of fame, freedom and entrapment, isolation, delusion compared to reality, and of course, the film noir genre and the techniques that partner that. And we'll take a look at how Wilder uses them um, to create a certain atmosphere and scene, if you will. Perfect. So, just as a brief character summary, we'll go into a bit more detail a bit later. Um, but we have Joe, he is the protagonist and the narrator in Sunset Boulevard. We see him at the beginning, um, obviously floating dead in the swimming pool. Um, and the film is a recount of the events that led to this. So there is a sense of inevitability throughout the film. You'll probably hear me say that a couple times um, throughout this lecture um, because we as the viewers know uh, what's going to happen ultimately that Joe will end up um, dead and I guess it's just a matter of how the events lead to that. Um, we do experience some pivotal points in the film that might leave the viewer wondering oh you know maybe Joe will end up like all right but ultimately we do 
know the ending and it is inevitable from the beginning. Um, but looking at some traits for Joe, he is quite noble, ambitious and charismatic, looking at some more positives. And if we take a look at some of the more negative aspects of his character, he's quite, um, I guess his morality is open to interpretation. It's quite ambiguous um, throughout the film. Um, there is some opportunistic um, characters to, characteristics to him as well. Um, and then if we take a look at Norma, who I guess is second most prominent, um, she is the former silent film star and she is ultimately determined to reobtain her past success in the spotlight of the film industry. So ultimately she tends to fall into the trap of her own delusions and dreams. So if we look at some positive characteristics for Norma, she is quite charming, successful and eccentric. Um, and if we look at some more negative aspects of her character, quite melancholic, stubborn and disillusioned. Um, feel free to take those words if you think they might help be helpful and maybe brainstorming for an essay. Um, but if we take a look at Max, he is the director during Norma's silent film Peak, obviously has stuck with her throughout her downfall and to where she is now. Um, and during the present moment of the film, he is her butler, um, but as later revealed in the film, was actually her first husband as well. Um, and then Betty, finally out of the kind of core four, if you will, she is the fiance to Joe's best friend, Artie, um, but is also Joe's main love interest, almost. There's a bit of a love triangle between Joe, Norma and Betty, um, as some of you, if you've watched the film, might have picked out. Um, but as a whole, Betty's character acts as a point of clarity throughout the film. And what I mean by that is a lot of the decisions that characters make or that Wilder paints them to make um, are quite clouded in the judgment. And Betty kind of acts as a clarity point in that regard. Um, she was able to uh, become aware of the illusion of the Hollywood industry quite early on compared to maybe people like Norma who are still kind of caught in the um, trans of like an ephemeral kind of career, um, if that makes sense. So Betty is kind of that clarity point. She's that um, clear thinker throughout the film. Perfect. So now just moving on to a scene by scene breakdown. So in the first two minutes, three minutes, we see the film open with a panning shot downwards towards the Sunset Boulevard sign. Um, so this kind of foreshadows the demise that will take place on the street. So one of the first scenes is the street name in the gutter, um, which I guess kind of contrasts the wider belief that the film industry is quite um, glamorous. You know, if the street name of a very popular and affluent street is in the gutter, you know, maybe that has a deeper meaning to that. Um, and that can also, I guess, tap into Wilder's moral high ground as well, being higher than um, the industry at the time. Um, yeah, so I think that's what that does. And we also see the street sign as well, normally after we've already seen the gutter. So it's kind of like that contrast between the two, what people think and what maybe the deeper meaning or the deeper um, understanding of the industry kind of tries to hide. Um, anyways, moving on. Um, we also see the low shot of the palm trees and the police cars. So this, again, kind of adding to um, the, I guess, awakening um, and the, it kind of opposes the glamour of the industry. It juxtaposes the, um, Hollywood industry kind of says like illusion versus reality, if that makes sense. Um, and then we also open with Joe's narration, talking about himself in the third person as we see him floating in the pool. It's quite a gothic and eerie vibe. So again, adding to that corruption of the Hollywood industry, Wilder really paints that picture throughout the first scene. Um, and then we have the dissolving shot of Joe dying in the pool to where, quote, it all started. Um, and I guess that notes how fast tragedy can progress in Hollywood. So that is that first little scene. 
this one's a bit more broader now. We're not going to move in three minute increments. That would take much longer. But looking at 250 to 12 minutes. Essentially, Joe asks for $300 from his agent who declines. We see Joe struggling to maintain his success as a screenwriter. So that's kind of that down and out screenwriter role that he takes on straight away. Um, I think Betty notes him to write um, trite scripts or scripts with no real um, quality to them. Joe kind of writes them just to get by. I think he notes it as like B grade scripts or something. I think that's a quote, um, the B grade scripts. Um, so we can see that maybe his effort is not um, at the same level that maybe it was when he started out in the industry. And I think that kind of links to the overall impression that once you enter Hollywood, fame is everlasting. And I think Wilder definitely debunks that ideology throughout the film. Um, but I think both Joe and Norma in different aspects were under that impression. And we can see that both of them struggle with that idea as well um, in different ways, of course. Um, but Joe is worried that he'll have to return back to quote that $35 a week job at the copy desk of the Dayton Evening Post. So that kind of links to that um, struggle that he's feeling as well. That's a nice quote to showcase that. Um, and then we move to Sheldrake's office, or we're still in there, where he forgets Betty's name. Uh, and this is the first kind of opener, I guess, to the um, gender roles and how women have to work a bit harder for respect in that industry, especially during that time, despite being in front or behind of the camera. Um, we see that with Norma and Betty, respectively, I guess. Um, Norma being in front, Betty being behind, both of them definitely have to, or attempt to work for respect in their role. Um, Norma may be a bit more delusion to it than Betty, but there you go. Um, Joe becomes entangled with the tax collectors slash insurance people. I think he calls them bloodhounds as a bit of an insight to his cynical persona. Um, and he attempts to drive away in his very symbolic car. Um, kind of ironic too, he drives from one problem just to reach another, um, cause the tire blows out coincidentally right at Norma's house. So I guess that ties to some fate there. Um, and this is kind of the first sign of how his independence maybe fades, um, whilst he hasn't developed a relationship with Norma yet. Um, we do see his agency fade throughout the film, um, and how Norma is definitely dominant, uh, in the relationship as well. So, next kind of scene. So, the sign that the um, mansion that Joe has stumbled upon kind of reflects the 1920s mansion. So, we see automatically, before even meeting Norma, how maybe she is stuck in the past, reflected upon by her house straight away. Um, and we see the funeral that she's holding for um, her pet chimp. Uh, Joe comes at almost a very, very perfect time to replace that chimp um, and is very much Norma's monkey. Um, and by that, I mean she can control him um, or begins to control him more as the film progresses, which I guess kind of links to his um, shrinking agency throughout the film. Um, yeah, so that's a nice symbol to maybe draw upon. Um, and Joe is mistaken for the coffin person. So once Norma realizes he isn't, she immediately sees an opportunity to take advantage of him. Um, I guess that could be interpreted as Norma taking advantage of Joe the way that the industry took advantage of her. We might touch upon that a little bit more when we're looking deeper into Norma. Um, but that is the kind of linking to the symbolism of the chimp as well. Um, and how Joe comes and replaces that. And a monkey or a chimp is um, quite um, easy to manipulate in that regard, I think, um, which could be what Wilder is trying to imply through that. Um, but Norma tries to get Joe to help her write her script so that she can make it back into the industry. So I guess this kind of shows insight into how she subconsciously knows she's not a part of the industry anymore. Um, but she most definitely refuses to accept the reality of her situation as evident in 
more than one scene. This obviously wouldn't be an example. Um, but yeah, she kind of knows that she isn't a part of it. And I think that's also symbolic when she does. Um, I mean, I haven't covered it in the breakdown yet, but when she does go to Paramount Studios after her, um, she thinks she's getting her big break again. Um, and the gates are actually shut. Um, she can't, um, I guess that's kind of symbolic of her not being a part of the industry anymore. I'll touch on that a bit later. It's a nice symbol to um, note down. But the gates are closed. The um, people supervising aren't, can't, aren't um, recognising her. And those that um, do are quite, um, they're the older generation. She's not a part of the current um, fixation in Hollywood. Um, so I think she tries to convince herself that she is. But I really think deep down she knows that she isn't. And that's what she's really fighting for. She's fighting to get back to the heights of her career. Quote. Um, amazing. So 22 to 32 minutes. Joe agrees to help Norma. I'm going to to him. His stuff is all relocated to her mansion while he sleeps. So this is a final indicator or one of the first indicators that his independence is slowly going to be disappearing or is beginning to disappear. Um, I think he thinks that he's in control in the situation, but really, um, with his agency getting smaller and smaller, just losing control even more, um, he really isn't, or he loses control. Maybe he controlled it at the beginning, thinking that, you know, getting some quick cash for writing a script for Norma, um, you know, turns into a much bigger problem for him, whilst he might have seen it as a bit of an out, especially with the insurance people being able to keep his car there, um, that we obviously see how that ends later. But Joe also asks why Max brought his things. Um, and Max continues to play the piano. He actually doesn't um, acknowledge Joe in this moment. Um, and I guess this links to Max Max's character overall. He's very much Norma's protector or views himself as Norma's protector. And it highlights how he kind of blocks out reality for the betterment of Norma. And by that I mean, you know, we see that he writes her fan letters. I'll cover that a bit later in this um, slide. Um, and whilst that actually does, um, I think, increase her delusion, Max wants to keep her happy. And I think, you know, he doesn't have too much dialogue compared to other characters. And I think this moment where he does ignore um, Joe can kind of, one of the first signs show that um, he really wants to protect Norma. So moving on, there is a high angled shot of Norma laying melodramatically surrounded by photos of herself. Um, very key moment, I think, um, when I'm working with students, this is one of the, the key moments in the film that kind of showcases her self-obsession. Um, the high camera shot in this scene symbolises how the viewers are higher than her, um, as well as kind of her desire to regain her status. And what I mean by that is there, if there's a high angled camera shot, um, the camera is above the actor or the scene in that sense. So if the viewers or the camera is higher than Norma, um, I guess it's symbolic of her trying to regain that status or that um, Wilder and the um, viewers are kind of higher than her um, status wise, if that makes sense. Um, Norma finds out Joe's situation and pays off his apartment. Um, again, moves his belongings, but not his car, so he can't leave. I guess we can see, linking back to that, um, losing control, losing his agency, Norma becoming increasingly um, dominant and manipulative in the relationship. Um, and Norma doesn't really talk about money too much around Joe, just as a little note, um, as she wants him to be dependent on her, I guess. Um, and I think Joe makes himself think that he doesn't need a job, um, because of this, um, but really some quick cash isn't necessarily a full-time job, is it? Um, and yeah, as I said, Norma reads letters, um, reads the fan letters that are actually from Max, not her thousands of fans that she thinks they're from. Um, and I said this a little bit before, I guess, this is kind of just not a moment in the scene, but Norma does end up using and abusing Joe to an extent. Um, and I guess that connection, as I've said before, can kind of be drawn to um, 
the way that the Hollywood system kind of used her very quickly. You know, when she was in, she was in, she was great, they loved her. And all of a sudden, when the talkies came along, that's some history in Hollywood, we'll touch on that later, um, or the films with dialogue came along and the silent film star wasn't necessary, she was kicked out or um, not needed anymore. And we see the result of that to her psychological well-being. Perfect. So when Joe is editing Norma's script, he cuts a scene of her at a slave market um, in her script as he thinks there's too much of her in the storyline. So naturally, being quite self-absorbed, trying to make a script that's about her for her big great, um, break, she gets upset. Um, and I guess those fan letters become clear of their um, effect when she's using them as an argument, saying that all these fans are writing letters to her when really um, it's not fans, it's just Max trying to protect her. So that is another example of Max feeding and heightening her delusions. So more photos of Norma are displayed throughout the house. Um, it creates quite a claustrophobic and quite an intense environment to be in when there are so many photos of this one person. Um, and I guess it's kind of cemented when Joe and Norma watch a film of her in the living room and it's one of Norma's old silent films. And I guess it reflects how she is stuck in that era still. There is a lot of evidence throughout the film um, and in particular scenes that really cement um, the fact that she is trying to gain back the heights of her career. Um, coming back to that quote again. And I guess it's the metaphorical heights of her career. You might like to use that as a nice phrase. Um, but Norma jumps up really quickly um, to point to herself on the screen when they're watching the film, um, which I kind of guess is... Um, almost childlike when you like point up and look at a screen um so that could be a note as well um her psychosis is becoming more prevalent when she talks to herself and saying how she'll be a star again um especially in this scene there might be some nice quotes there um not sure if they're in this presentation but again if you look up a pdf copy of the script there are so many online that you can use Control f um and look up those key quotes um Moving on, there's another high-angled camera shot. These are really common with Norma. Wilder uses them as a technique. We'll go through it a bit later um, to kind of support what I've said before about Norma being lesser, if that makes sense. Um, anyway, high-angled shot of Norma playing cards with the waxwork, so the other people um, during her era, with Joe sitting behind her, almost like a puppy dog. Um, and Joe says he got her winnings, which added to about 70 cents. Um, he notes that this was um, the only money he ever got from her. So he actually didn't get that cash. Um, I think we know that Norma bought him clothes and things like that. I'll touch on that a bit um, in the later scenes. Um, but he only ever got 70 cents, which is not what he was promised. Quick, quack, quick cash, yes. Um, but I think we'd expect a bit more than that. Um... So, yeah, I guess that's um, saying that he remains dependent when he's with her. So, moving on to the next scene. There's a sense of urgency throughout the sound um, of the flute um, as well. Um, I'll get back to that a little bit. Um, it kind of shows how Joe's finances are haunting him. Um, and Max tries to help Joe when his car is found. So that's kind of the scene that this music is playing in. Um, and he knows how normal will handle the situation. So we do see a glimpse into Max's morality there, um, trying to help Joe, um, despite what Norma will think. He is trying to help Joe when his car is found. Um, but Norma ignores Joe when he is in obvious need of her financially um, and manipulates Joe in order for him to lose his autonomy, I guess, entirely. Um, we do see it decrease a little more, um, but I guess this is a pretty key point when she denies um, his needs um, and takes him to the clothing shop. Uh, and Norma is wearing sunglasses inside, so I guess 
again, symbolic of shielding herself from the outside world or the things that she's afraid of as well. And we'll touch a bit on that um, when looking at Norma's character in more detail as well. Um, so Norma pays for Joe's very expensive and well-made clothes. And I guess this kind of symbolizes how he, again, financially depends on her um, and Norma, again, trying to manipulate him. So there's a bit of a symbolic um, meaning behind that as well. Um, usually shoes um, as a symbol, they kind of um, symbolize a standing point. So I'll go into it a bit more um, later, but shoes and whether Joe is wearing them or not, or the type of shoes, I guess can um, represent his viewpoint or his um, clarity of thought um, throughout the film. But we'll touch on that a bit later when we're looking at some of the um, film techniques used. Um, and just moving, I guess, to the garage where Joe was initially, um, uh, where he was initially staying when he was, um, living with Norma. There was rain in the garage, which, um, means it was ruined and he had to move in officially to the mansion. So again, another sign of his autonomy weakening, weakening, um, there will be a few of these signs because we see it gradually decrease throughout the film, um, but it's also ironic that Joe will be sleeping in her former husband's room. Um, and Norman's husband actually didn't share a bed with her as well, which is something to note. So moving on to the next scene, Norma slaps Joe for not wanting to uh, love her, essentially. So we can see that dominance coming in there as well. And the reverse gender roles in their relationship. Um, I'll touch more on that when we look at the themes. This is just a brief overview of uh the scenes but um yeah their traditional gender roles in a relationship especially during the 1950s um Norma and Joe are the complete opposite so where um Norma is strong and dominating Joe is quite um weak and submissive um which obviously opposes those traditional roles um uh, but we'll tap more into that as well so Artie talks to Joe about his coat, um, which is the one he didn't want in the shop and almost bought it for him anyways. Um, and Joe very quickly changes the topic of conversation. So I think he's in denial about his situation with Norma or he doesn't want to accept it and is quite embarrassed as well of the relationship that he has with her or has begun to develop with her because it was meant to be... Um, kind of a transaction relationship, you know, like, um, you know, you write me a script, you pay me money, done. But I think that transactional relationship kind of develops um, or expands into that more personal um, level. But I still think it's transactional. They are still both wanting things from each other. It's not a relationship that um, forms off of love, really. Um, and yeah. But there is also a close-up shot of Betty and Joe, and they are playing out a scene that they may potentially write. Um, there is a lot in common between those two, and the closeness of them illuminates their attraction even more. So Betty, as a whole, is a foil character to Norma, or um, they juxtapose each other. They are opposing characters, um, in other words. Um especially for their personality as well. Um, especially, as I said, that Betty was kind of that clarity point. Um, Norma definitely, I think, even upon first viewing, does not um, really take on the role of the um, clear thinker. She obviously is framed around her delusions and her aspirations. Um, and that is very opposing to Betty, who still has ambitions, but um, is more realistic as well and has a different approach to that um, than Norma. So Norma has also self-harmed and slit her wrists and Joe cares enough for her that he does not want to be the reason that she ends her life. So we can see that he does care for her but I think it still is on that kind of superficial level. It's not quite love or the way that um, he learns to love Betty. It's not that um, type of attraction. Um, there's also the dissolving shot of Joe at the party. This is the New Year's Eve party. Um, and he actually takes a taxi to go back to the mansion. So he has given up his autonomy and his, um, free choice, um, for Norma to go back to the mansion. So 
New Year's Eve, just like as a general kind of symbol, if we're moving away from the film for a second, um, is kind of symbolic of um, a time of change and transition. You know, everybody celebrates a happy new year and you get all your New Year's resolutions ready um, to change. And if we're putting that in the context of the film, really there should be some sort of transition there for Joe as the protagonist, but he goes straight back to Norma after the New Year's Eve party. So we can see that um, it's kind of, he's not changing that much, essentially. So that could be a little something you include as well in your essays or your planning, maybe some background information. So kind of, I guess, looking some at some techniques here, there is quite an optimistic um, sound that contrasts the situation they're in. It's almost a positive situation for Norma in the sense that she's been able to bring Joe back, um, even though she's hurt herself, so it's not realistically that positive. Um, but he's come back to her. So I guess in that sense, it's um, a positive. Um, and Max doesn't let Betty talk to Joe. He doesn't want Joe to leave. Um, not for Joe's sake, but again... Norma's protector, he's protecting her, wants the best for her if Joe makes her happy. Um, there's a quote down here as well. I've never been happier in my life, in this last line here. Um, if Norma is happy with Joe, then Max um, pretty much dictates, Joe stays. Betty cannot talk to Joe, essentially. Um, and just as a bit of a symbol here as well, we'll tap into it again in a bit more detail, but the pool... Um, at the beginning of the film, obviously a bit past the introduction where Joe's um, floating in it, um, but it does start off when Joe arrives at the mansion as empty and the pool is now filled up. Um, so it kind of corresponds um, to Norma's mental state. When it's full, she's content and psychologically stable, I guess. And it's in this scene that Norma says, I've never been happier in my life. Um, so... I guess she's dependent on a companion to be happy, um, but it's also, I guess, symbolic of that pool as well, which is also a symbol for Joe and his um, ambitions, but we'll tap into that a bit later. Okay, so we find out that um, Hollywood want Norma to come back, um, but for her car. But Norma thinks that she's getting her big break, um, when in reality, uh, she's not. <laughs> but um, as a viewer, we know that and we watch Norma kind of be very deluded by her ambitions, I guess. She's wanting that big break. Joe was writing that script for her and she finally thinks it's happening and realistically, it's actually not. Um, and this is what I was talking about before with the gates. When she gets there, the security guard doesn't know who she is and the gates are closed. So this symbolizes how she's never really going to be a part of the current Hollywood again. Um, gates are closed, can't go in, people don't recognise her. That all kind of just adds up together. Um, so DeMille also reveals that Norma was a terror to work with towards the end of her career. Um, and I guess there's some dramatic irony as well, as I said, um, that the audience knows why Gordon Cole, um, Cole called, which was for her car, but Norma thinks she's getting a big break so I guess that's the technique you could use to associate that if you were going to talk about it in an essay context um and Hogai turns the spotlight to Norma this is when she's in Paramount Studio she's um close by to DeMille nobody's really recognizing her except for um really only older people go up to her as I was saying before um it's the attention she's been craving for she's crowded by um heaps of people but they're not people who would be classified as current or into current things in the industry. Um, so she lifts her arms up above her um, eye as well. But um, yeah, it's really important to note that only older people go up to her. There's no younger people going and crowding around her. Everybody who gives her the attention she's wanted is of that older generation. Um, Norma cries quite melodramatically as she realized how much she's missed um, Paramount Studios and the world that she's longed for for a very long time um, and DeMille says just quite um, blankly that her script will be an expensive production um, so he's kind of sugarcoating it to her 
um, instead of saying that it's a bad script, he's quite sympathetic towards her, I guess, and her situation, and says that it's an expensive production, um, rather than saying no. <laughs> um, but we do know that it's not going to really be produced. Um, Joe sees Betty walking on the balcony of Paramount Studios as well, and he attempts to hide himself, so that's kind of symbolic of how he's embarrassed of his situation, I guess. So when Norma is leaving, um, DeMille places a kiss on her forehead, so he feels sorry for her. There's some more of that sympathy there as well. Um, perfect. And Norma believes that she will film Salome, so that's the script, um, which is symbolic, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in this presentation. Um, she believes that she'll film Salome with Jamil, tells Cole to forget about the car, feeling um, bad for her. So Jamil tells um, Cole to forget about the car because he doesn't want to feed her false hope, I guess, um, which is very much what she's <laughs> um, thinking, um, that she'll get her big break, but unfortunately not. Uh, so Norma starts to think that Joe is seeing someone else. Joe denies the allegations, but he does go to see Betty um, and they have quite a um, heartfelt conversation. She reveals that she got a nose job um, and that she decided that she didn't want to try and fit in in front of the camera and that she thinks that being behind the camera is really more fun, um, which is a quote. I think might want to check my wording there. I'm sure I've included it a bit later. Um, but the two essentially bond over some banter. So Joe innocently kisses her nose after she said she got a nose job. Um, and the two share a nice moment together, which is very much a contrast to the Joe's relationship with Norma. Um, so there's those foil characters or that juxtaposition coming in again. Um, perfect. So Max reveals to Joe that he was Norma's first husband. Um, and Norma was excited that Joe returned from being with Betty, but then questions where he was. There is a dissolving shot into Joe and Betty typing together, um, which kind of allows the audience to sympathize with both Joe and Norma um, and their circumstances. Um, you know, Joe wanting to kind of escape from feeling trapped, but Norma has finally found somebody that she thinks she can be with and trust. So there is some, um, there is an ability to sympathize with both parties there. Um, okay, so Betty realises she loves Joe. Music suggests, like, in the background, the score um, would be the formal technique, um, that their love can only lead to tragedy. So she's already engaged, essentially. It's not um, ethical in that sense. Um, but nonetheless, Joe and Betty kiss, and it leads to a dissolving shot into Joe opening the gates of Norma's Palazzo. Perfect. Um, Norma is on the phone to Betty, questioning her um, and I guess her machinations have gone far beyond just success. Now also about her relationship with Joe. Um, she's, there, so I guess there, her um, delusions have crossed from just being about her career but also keeping Joe and not wanting him to go either. She's lost her career, doesn't want to lose Joe. Um, but Joe grabs the phone from Norma um, which is, I guess, a sign of him temporarily regaining his autonomy. Yay. Um, it took the whole film, but he did it, um, temporarily. We know how it ends, unfortunately, but that's kind of one of those signs I was talking about where, um, we know what happens. It's inevitable that Joe dies, but there are moments like that where he does regain his autonomy and we really hope that it will work out for him. But ultimately we know his fate as a viewer. Um, so Betty almost gives Joe an out. He, um, she encourages him to leave with her and she covered her face as, um, though she can't look at him anymore, um, ultimately because he decided not to. He wanted to protect Norma. Um, but I guess she kind of misjudged him thinking he would choose love over, over financial stability. But, um, in reality, Joe actually did what he did to save Betty. So he did kind of choose love in that sense. Norma thinks he picked her over Betty. Um, Joe attempts to pack up his suitcase, sign of him trying to regain his autonomy once again. Um, and he starts telling Norma a bunch of truth. So the truth about Paramount calling her about the car. Max doesn't accept or deny these claims um, because he obviously still wants to protect her. Um, but because of this, Norma is kind of more encouraged to believe her delusions, um, that she's the greatest star of them all. Um, as Max is not denying this and she's had Max for 
a longer period of time than Jo. Um, and Jo's telling her stuff that she doesn't want to hear, so we can see how she will definitely lean into um, Max's, um, not suggestions, but he's not accepting or denying the claims. So the flourishing score kind of builds up um, as the two shots have been fired that hit Joe in his stomach. Um, and then it pretty much falls silent when Joe, um, when Norma shoots Joe for the last time in his back. Um, I guess that last um, bullet is kind of symbolic of her really crossing that line between delusion and reality. Like the line is so blurred at this point. Um, and as we move to the famous closing scene where she's ready for her, um, close up, she's actually, Norma is actually dressed in her Salome costume. So it's as if she's fully taken on the part of this character, which is why that script is so symbolic. And we will talk about it in a bit more depth than I have, um, a bit later when we look at those symbols and motifs. Um, but that, um, is a nice summary so this is just a nice one page summary to summarize everything i've just gone through a lot of information but hopefully you guys have watched the film by now um if you've done it for your first text response i think your sack would have already passed um but if you're doing it in second semester um then hopefully you still may have watched the film on the holidays but as for a one page summary Joe is struggling financially, led to Norma's mansion. She wants him to write a script so that she can make her return to Hollywood, wants her big break again, and he increasingly becomes more entangled into her delusions, loses his agency and autonomy, um, and he really needs that financial support. And Norma gives it to him to an extent, um, but when he really, really needs his car and things like that, she kind of manipulates it um, to keep him or stop him from leaving. So Norma becomes increasingly attached to Joe. Um, as I said before, that uh, chimp is very symbolic. Um, he takes the place um, of the chimp that dies at the beginning of the film. Um, and as we know, I guess Joe dies at the end as well, but we know he's already dead at the beginning. Um, perfect. So Norma gets a call from Paramount Studios and she believes she's having a big break finally. Um, but again, dramatic irony, we know why they're actually calling. Um, they really just want her car. Um, yeah, and Joe becomes closer to Betty. The two share a couple of intimate moments, um, which Norma begins to get suspicious of. And Joe tries to leave and break off his relationship with Norma. And we see that, um, line blur between delusion and reality. Her delusions really transform into psychosis at this point, And she shoots him. And Norma dresses up in her salome costume as she descends the staircase. The cameras flash and she is, quote, ready for her close up. Um, the moment she has ironically, unironically longed for the entire film, um, wanting that moment with the cameras flashing.